Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're here continuing our deep dive into 2001's Cats and Dogs for our third birthday celebration. Cam, we have a very special guest joining us. And who might it be? Yes, we are talking to the director of the film, Larry Guterman. Absolutely. There's a lot of work went into this film. We spoke a lot about it earlier this week, and Larry has a lot to say about cats and dogs. So I think without further ado, Cam, roll it. And joining us now on the show, the director of this week's film, Cats and Dogs, Mr. Larry Guterman. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Great. Great. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. All the better for having you here. Thank you for helping me cover the uh, flub that will be edited out of this, but we'll leave it in uh, as like a little joke for my expense. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your help there. You're clearly a professional. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> you, can, you can stop me if I start directing something. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. We need the direction. It's fine. Um, I, we'll get to cats and dogs in a minute. But I think before we get there, I kind of want to, paint a wee bit of a picture about how you got to that film and got to directing. And so the first question I always like to lead off with is what got you into filmmaking? What inspired you to get into the industry in the first place? Well, that's a good question. I think when I was seven, um, my uncle gave me a flip book, animated flip cards mm -hmm. of a rabbit jumping out of a hat. And then when I was probably nine, my grandfather gave me a Super 8 camera. And I started making live action and animated movies from then and uh i remember once it's funny you should ask that i hadn't even thought about this but we had a like a fight sequence action thriller movie fight sequence on the rooftop of the apartment building where i grew up which had 12 stories and we built a dummy and you know we did the punching and whatever and then we cut to the angle of the dummy getting thrown over down the 12 stories and then we ran downstairs to get the coverage from down below. And this woman was screaming because <laughs> <laughs> it was literally our building was in the corner of a semi major intersection in Toronto. And she came running over in her high heels. You know, she could barely, she could barely manage. I thought I thought somebody jumped off the building and we were like, you know, I don't know, 16 and we didn't care or we didn't think it's not that we didn't care. It did not even occur to us that it would be a problem that this would be in full view of the public without any warning. <laughs> so I often bemoan the lack of dummies in movies these days. And mm -hmm. uh, I'd hear that that's the origin story for you. That's right. Those are the, uh, those are the, that's the old school uh, method of doing things. Yeah. It's funny. I, I watched John Wick four whenever it came out with my son and I liked the sequence, love the sequence around l'arc de triomphe mm -hmm. the when it went in a circle in the cars are, and i went back and looked at some of the the making ofs and i didn't realize i was sure that was like 95 percent cg stunt doubles sure. and cg car doors getting hit and cd tr cg trucks having bodies thrown at them and tons of it was live mm -hmm. with like foam trucks, like cars that worked 100%, but where the bodies were made out of foam and painted to look like metal. And so, and stunt people flying into them and bouncing off windows, literally, and because they weren't made out of metal and glass. And I, I assume, actually, that the entire surface of the ground was covered in painted rubber as well. Mm. So they could go bouncing off the pavement and not die hitting their heads on the pavement. <laughs> um, I, although I didn't, I didn't read that anywhere, but I'm guessing that's the case, just like children's playgrounds where it looks sort of, uh, where you step on it and it's kind of spongy. Mm, right. So, um, so that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, obviously tons of effects are, are done with CGI replacement now. So, and, and it's only going to increase with all the AI driven visual effects stuff coming. Just wait till the entire film's made by a computer. Writers, directors, everything. It's all just generated. That's the scary future, well, that, isn't it? That is... Um, I was talking about this with someone. So the data that's been collected up to whatever it is, September of 2021, certainly chat, GPT. I don't know about mid-journey and those, but... So there'll be this period of time where people start making movies just by literally cutting and pasting within using AI to generate the images and the shot design and everything. But then there's going to be this critical mass of stuff that's being vacuumed up by the AI programs 
that's been made by AI. Mm -hmm. And then after like five years, I think it will start getting really janky. Mm. Everything will start to be really strange looking because it'll just be self cannibalizing. And there won't be a, there won't be as much nearly as much data out there that's created by hand, essentially, versus what's been generated by AI. So it'll be like training on itself. I don't know. That's just a thought. There's like an uncanny valley feeling with AI. I think I had AI write an intro for the show once. Just not we didn't actually use it, but I just did it for my own kind of like yeah. just uh, you know, kicks and giggles. And it, it, yeah, you could see what it was trying to do, but something about it just didn't feel genuine. Right. It's strange. And so, yeah, as you say, if you put that through a sieve a bunch of times, eventually you're going to get this just mess of just generic terms that kind of point you in the right direction, but don't do anything for you. And that, yeah, so I'm hoping it does kind of uh, sort of wear itself out eventually and this whole thing goes away. Because like my wife is a photographer. So she's in the, she's oh, okay. in the, she's in the sort of arts medium. And that's all to do with like, you know, uh branding and owning your own images and things like that and this is taking all that away it's a, it's a, a undiscovered country at the moment i imagine it's going to be very demoralizing like you said for people and then people are just going to have to leverage it to their advantage and understand how to use the new tool and but it is a unbelievably dramatic change mm -hmm. i mean it's you know as some people say as big as the industrial revolution i mean in terms of the broad the broad application not just in media obviously so so we shall see but i think photography's been around since like the late 1820s i know i, I know 1847 was some seminal year but i think there were actual photographs taken in the late 1820s there was one or two so it's two it's coming up on 200 years of photography so hopefully she'll get another uh, I, I, i'm just hoping she keeps working because it's, it's it's certainly helping my lifestyle but um <laughs> but i I'm, I'm straying on to the life of scott hardy and people don't want to hear about that they want to hear about you larry so you've chucked the dummy okay. off the roof you filmed it you, you get the taste for it by the sounds of it yeah loved it grew up in toronto never thought grew up uh grew up in a time that was previous to when you guys grew up judging by uh how old you guys look compared to me oh, <laughs> and uh, you. how young you how young you look <laughs> um and so um I never thought I was going to do film in a million years mm. so I made animated features I I bought I used a super 8 camera instead of um hand painting cells I I drew on registration paper animation registration paper and then hand cut out the foreground characters and put them on backgrounds so there was a foreground and background wow. and did claymation stuff and everything <clears throat> and live action. And then I got, I, my freshman year, I went to MIT. I was going to do physics or engineering, but during the summers, I went to Sheridan college, which is a big animation school near Toronto and Oakville, which is like the Cal arts back then. There were only two in the world. There were not like there's a hundred animation schools now, like in Vancouver and hmm. Florida, there was Cal arts and there was Sheridan. And Sheridan was like the Cal Arts of Canada. Mm. And um, this this was, I went for three summers to the International Summer School of Animation just because I loved it as a hobby. My, I, I transferred to Harvard. I majored in physics, but I kept doing animation. I took filmmaking classes at Harvard. I took um, computer graphics, computer animation, uh, computer programming, um, math, physics, whatever. But I was always I always loved animation. And then I made a film my senior year when I was at Harvard and I loved it. Like I just fell in love with it and live action film. And um, so then I applied for so as I interviewed at like Solomon Brothers, which is like Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. back then, still around and all these companies and the NSA <laughs> and they didn't, by the way, side note. I did not get an offer from the NSA because my mother is Canadian. Oh, oh. Canada was considered it was considered uh, you know not a safe enough country from a security standpoint, which is interesting. That seems backwards, um, but sure. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. It is completely the reverse. Um, so, uh, so I worked i got a job as an intern so i i saw all there were all the i interviewed at, at, at these wall street firms and they were a very button down back then and it was just non-stop 12 13 hours a day of you know financial analysis and so forth 
Yeah, I was actually an interviewing for what's called a quantitative analyst role. Mm -hmm. And then I saw an ad in the back of something called Computer Pictures Magazine from a company called PDI, Pacific Data Images, which was later bought by DreamWorks. They're the company that made Ants and they made uh, Madagascar and a bunch of movies. Anyway, Shrek. Um, and they, um, all the people in that ad were wearing shorts and running shoes. <laughs> and it was, it was in sunny Sunnyvale, California. So I applied to that and I got a job as an intern there that summer, made like $11 an hour um, and worked there for a summer, made a little short at night with computer animation tools that they had. There were no interactive tools. You couldn't get you to write the code mm -hmm. using their animation language to do it. I made a little short. Um, then I moved down to LA that, that fall fall of 87, got a job as a script reader for Joel Silver's company when they were making Die Hard. Right. And then I got a job at a computer animation company called Metro Light. And then in the fall of 88, I got a job for a producer at Columbia Pictures. Uh, and she was old school Hollywood, like intense, screaming, chain, whatever. Chain smoking with a martini at 9 a.m. And just... <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't chain smoking, but, but she was... I mean, I learned a lot from her, but her MO and her method of doing business would not work in today's sure. Hollywood. Um, anyway, so that was quite a learning experience. And then I went and I did that for about eight months. And I would get videotapes across my desk from film schools, NYU, AFI, UCLA, USC. And some of them were really good. And I was like, ah, I don't want to serve service the people making these films. I want to be the person making them. Mm. So I applied back to USC film school. I did that, went back to USC film school um, in 1990 um, and in the uh, spring of 90. And then um, after a couple of years, and I edited one of the shorts, the workshop shorts, which you have to be an editor or director of photography or a writer in order to then apply to be a director, one of them. Okay. And one of the professors was Bob Zemeckis, the director of Back to the Future and Roger Rabbit. And I ran up to him at the end of the semester. He was leaving for good. It was the end of his teaching. And um, he rolled down his black tinted window in his giant <laughs> Mercedes. And he's like, what is it? And I wasn't in his class. I was in the dailies weekly because I was an editor. Only the directors and writers were in his class. And he said, and he had already offered to um, allow students to come in and pitch for a Tales from the Crypt episode. Mm. So he was producing that show with um, Joel Silver and Richard Donner. And so I said, can I pitch an episode? And he's like, he knew that I wasn't a writer or director. Yeah, I was an editor. And he said, okay, but don't tell anyone. And so um I called his assistant. I had a writing partner. We called his assistant every week for three months that summer. And she kept saying, call him next week. He's busy. <laughs> and then at the end of the semester, end of the summer, we finally got some advice about just staying. Do not get off the call without a meeting. And it was a hard, one of the hardest things I ever did. But I called and I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it next week. I can't do it the week after. I can't do it the week after that. And she's like, okay, you guys are persistent. She called back. She said, okay, you have a meeting. And then we had a six ideas for tales from the crypts we went in to pitch them we based them on the comic the old 50s comic book we would take one panel and update it for the 90s it, they weren't contemporary stories so we updated the setting and the context and not we didn't even use the stories we just used like a an inspiring an inspiring mm -hmm. panel of art mm. and one of them he started talking in the room while we were pitching to him at universal and he starts going on and on and we're like oh crap and i took out a pencil and a pad and started writing down the notes and he started pacing and he added ideas and then at the end he said all right you guys the other ideas are good but this one i love i'm probably going to direct it as part of a three-part anthology with walter hill and richard donner wow and uh and i'm hiring you guys a whole, a whole other story after being hired hbo didn't even realize it was happening the assist the his development person hadn't told them anyway eventually we got hired we wrote it he was directing death becomes her we got to go down to the set while he was directing that and and then meet him in his trailer and work on the notes and that went great and he was ready to do it and then he got busy with a little film called forrest gump <laughs> and they never did and they never did the anthology i mean this is typical you know only 10 percent of stuff 
that makes it to that level even gets the chance of being made. So, um, but at the time we sold a sci-fi action kind of spy script to Paramount and he read it and liked it. He loved the action writing and um, wanted, at, was going to give it to Joel Silver, but we said it was already sold. And, th and that's when we started our writing. And then after doing writing, after uh, we wrote, I wrote a thesis film with my writing partner. And then I directed that. I used a letter from Bob Zemeckis to get free equipment around town. Nice. And um, I shot it on 35 millimeter. And that was called The Headless. That got some attention at the USC festivals. Um, I, I think I invited like 1,400 people. My fiance and I sent out physical invites <laughs> to the entire what's called Hollywood Creative Directory. Like maybe 15 people came from that. And of those 15, one was someone who I had met years earlier who was working in DreamWorks, junior executive, it ended up being the executive on American Beauty, um, went and um, uh, tried to get the president of the studio to watch the film. He wouldn't watch it and eventually gave it to Spielberg, like after four months mm. of being blown off by the other guy. Spielberg watched it, liked it. I got a call. January, early January, 95 or six, probably six, 96, saying, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is the guy didn't watch it. The good news is Spielberg watched it. He thought she had a good eye. He wants you to come in and meet. And that's when I got hired to direct this Goosebumps CD-ROM game, which was a interact flagship interactive game at DreamWorks. It was financed by Bill Gates. He came down. I got to meet him. Uh, he was already worth $50 billion at like 40 years old. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and I directed that. That went well. That won some awards, Time Magazine, Best Kids Game and stuff. And then I got hired to direct on Ants, computer animated feature. Well, I just, sorry, just to bump in. I was just curious, the difference between, you know, directing shorts versus directing like a CD-ROM game. Well, let, let's put it this way. That game was like the fax machine of video games in the sense that it was neither here nor there. It wasn't a first person shooter, fully rendered, you know, real time rendering with textures. Cause that didn't exist yet. Yeah. Um, and so any version of that was crappy looking and, you know, Minecraft harks back to, <laughs> to what everything looked like back then. And then not that Minecraft is bad, um, but ju just that it was just, simple looking so they tried this new thing which was pivots and rails which was we were di i directed the whole live action portion of it there was about an hour of material and it combined live action with cgi with miniatures with motion control with puppetry with animatronics like everything in the kitchen sink thrown in at it there was some stuff that was similar to something we were doing and spielberg came by in post he came by in post-production and um said oh we're doing some of that in in jurassic in the second i guess he was working on the second or maybe the first year i can't remember which he the first one already came out oh he was talking about how he used something like that in the first one right that we were doing like only a year and a half later um that nobody was doing um so we we're kind of pushing pushing the limits a little bit in terms of the technology of that game and that game is very beloved if you go online people love like when they talk about it oh that's my childhood whatever um so no, it's actually very strange because when I was looking sort of doing my research on you, I, I saw you did this game and I had an instant flashback in my head of being and playing a Goosebumps game around this period. I don't know if it is that game, if they released any more, but I remember there being like an, an adventure game where you kind of choose your, your path a little bit and that you have the different sort of like cutscenes and stuff and you can kind of figure your way through it. And I, I distinctly remember that, but again, I was probably like, eight when it came out so probably yeah. the appropriate age but i i think i may have actually played this game you may, you may have played the game if there was live action in it then yeah, you yeah, played yeah. It. i don't definitely live action the game. yeah so so that was that was cool and then i got um they brought me in on i was going to possibly do small soldiers mm, right and if you remember that movie. i love that movie yeah but then, but then they were moving forward with ants quicker and they wanted someone who had a live action sensibility because it was their first cgi move 3d cgi mm -hmm. movie and the people in animation are amazing, but their training had mostly been in two-dimensional tableaus sure. and composing for that flat screen. And so they wanted somebody. So I worked on that. I directed the, 
the march to battle and the battle with the termites if you remember this big sort of star trip troopers type battle yeah yep. <laughs> um, and the termites and a bunch of other scenes in it uh, i directed the camera stuff for the shoe to shoe rescue when he's diving to rescue the the princess when they're caught on gum under a giant shoe and it's yeah uh, and then uh and then i then i got hired to direct curious george a live action cgi movie for universe i worked on that for a year that version didn't go um although it was great to work on um and then i got cats and dogs so that that brings me up to cats and dogs i know that's a long no, no, a long wait this is the part <laughs> that you've given us the exact trajectory that you took and i suppose the question maybe before we lead into cats and dogs is you know looking at sort of going from doing the short and then you're doing the video game which is incorporating a lot of the elements funnily enough i think would you'd end up seeing in cats and dogs um and you've got sort of ants in the middle there how did you find transitioning from all of those sort of stepping stones? Because you've gone from a short to a video game where you're the director. That's a much bigger project than a short. And then you're doing scenes in like the first DreamWorks, DreamWorks film. That's a, again, an added pressure. But did you find it quite seamless or was it a lot of learning process to go through? How did, how did you deal with all of that? Um, I had enough skills of a skill set in different areas mm. because I had done character animation that informed computer animation. Because I had done computer graphics and computer science in college, I knew how all that stuff worked. Um, because I directed live action for my thesis film, I knew how to direct on a set. So there was sort of a confluence of my skill set and kind of what was happening. Mm -hmm. There was a huge amount of, I will not, th there's an enormous amount of luck. The fact that DreamWorks happened to be starting yeah. right then, they just announced it like, eight months earlier or something and they're like oh my god we got to do a video game who are we going to hire and we don't have any money yet <laughs> i mean they just were starting okay we'll hire someone out of film school who looks like he could probably do this but won't cost that much money i think i made like <laughs> i worked on that thing for like eight months i think i made like 15 grand total because it was really just for the two months of the directing mm. but i ended up editing that thing at night every night for another eight months like putting it like assembling it um and it was great. I loved doing it. I mean, it was tons of fun. Um, wasn't afraid. I wasn't nervous technically mm. about how to how to graduate from those things. It's sort of comical that I went from ants to <laughs> I was going to do like Curious George's the Monkey to Canines and Feel. I mean, that's sort of and that's partly comical and partly a little bit of a typecasting thing. Weirdly sure. enough, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, when I did Cats and Dogs, I was like, okay, I want to do the Terminator or Mission Impossible, but they happen to be Cats and Dogs, and that's why it's going to be funny. Right. And people who saw the movie didn't think, oh, that guy can direct an action movie. They thought, oh, that guy can direct animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just just <laughs> jumping forward, just jumping forward, right? But to come back, I actually, it was not overwhelming to, to go from one to the next. I mean, I still had to learn a lot mm. on the fly um in terms of process you know making an animated feature is an entirely different process than making a live action feature so i kind of had to know both for each of the different films and then you're right cats and dogs sort of combined a lot of elements i mean a ton of elements uh, and plus animatronics and puppetry and uh, cgi face replacement and full 3d cgi and live action and just making it all feel seamless well, you just go back to looking at your your start. You know, you're going to MIT, mathematics, physics, that sort of stuff. It, it is sort of converging for you at this point. Like, it feels like you are the exact right person for that task because you are probably a bit ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and how best to utilize it. So, I mean, of course, you could say a little bit about like typecasting, but also at the same time, they want the best person for the job. And if you know yeah. how to deal with these things or can visualize it, yes. I'd, I'd say that's a good thing. I think I think that actually shows in cats and dogs, personally speaking. I think it shows it's got someone who knows what they're doing because I think in different pair of hands, that sort of like face replacements on the dogs and stuff could have been a, a, a real rough time. Uh, pardon the pun. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a good point. No, you're 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 right. I think your your observation about being slightly ahead of the curve is right, and I think um, only because I was thrown into the middle of. The cutting edge of technology that was happening at that point and so i could apply that 
also i had um life drawing i a drawing uh, anatomical life drawing in high school for a couple of years mm. like three years and then i did it during animation school during the summers that made a big difference in two ways for animation i could literally draw out the poses i wanted or the expressions i wanted for for example the cgi characters in cats and dogs and i could do very very quick sketches of a sequence for the storyboards for the sequence for the dp or the or whoever and i could literally map that out and that was how i would typically edit it in fact that was the first thing i did when i got hired on cats and dogs was i did a quick thumbnail and it's essentially that exact thumbnail that's in the movie of the ninja cats coming in on uh drones at night and parachuting down to to make the uh to break into the the brody home and and uh you know do what they're gonna do so yeah um, and i'd read that that kung fu cat test clip was pretty crucial in basically persuading people that the movie could be made is that accurate where did you read that Oh boy, it was some like film notes site uh, with a lot okay. of production notes from the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it wasn't that sequence. It was a correct. So we did it. So we conceived of I conceived of a test to show the studio. The movie was not green lighted yet. Mm. So I conceived of a test along with the physical production executive Chris Defaria, who is sort of my partner in crime, getting this movie. <laughs> past the finish line it was an ama amazing guy um and um the test was then we shot it on the back lot at warner brothers my buddy andrew terman from film school was the dp on it and then we did the visual effects with the mill in, in london i don't think they're around anymore maybe they are i'm not sure hmm. have you heard of them i'm not great when it comes to sort of production studios i wouldn't know unfortunately okay. I, could, I could look it up but i wouldn't know so yeah, so in that test, there's a live action dog. He comes to the, the the fire is crackling. It's nighttime. There's a picture of the family above the hearth. The camera comes down. There's a dog that golden retriever, gold lit by the golden hues of the firelight. He kind of sits down comfortably, and in the background you see this window, and it's it's colonial home. You know, it's like all American. And then the window opens, and it's this cat. It kind of pops his head up. And then ju jumps in. It's a CGI cat. And then he does a bunch of backflips all of a sudden. And he lands. And the dog is there. The dog kind of looks at him like dog like. Mm -hmm. And the cat starts doing Bruce Lee moves, but like over the top moves and Wah! <laughs> all the sounds from Kung Fu and stuff. And just overdoes it. Right. He's sort of um, boastfully. And then the dog just punches him in the face and he goes flying and lands and the dog kind of looks at the camera and goes, what a dumbass!" And that's, that's it. That's the whole test. And we showed that in screening room 12 at Warner Brothers, which is like a legendary screening room there. And there were like 30 executives in that room, including Alan Horn, the chairman of the studio. And it was like, either we're going to get this movie green lighted or I got to move on. I actually, was maybe going to direct this movie called Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Back then it was Drew Barrymore and maybe Bill Murray. I didn't know. Anyway, they didn't end up do, doing that movie for many years later. But um, I was very excited about Cats and Dogs because it was such a funny script. Mm. And uh, we're sitting in the room. This thing is like the test is like less than a minute. Mm. And the test runs, and it's like nerve wracking. And then as soon as that dog says, what a dumbass, everybody's laughing, all the executives. And I was like, OK, I know we have a green light right at that exact moment. And then, you know, Alan Horn turned around and looked at me. He wasn't exactly laughing, but they all were. So what was he going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but I think he liked it. But he but he said, but the now the, but the rendering and stuff was very primitive. Mm -hmm. on the cat so it didn't look photo real so it didn't but but it was the action the shot design and the choreography and the sound effects and then the dog face replacement that that covered for the bad rendering cgi rendering mm -hmm. enough to make everybody laugh and so that kind of overcame the problem and he said but the cat is that gonna i go yeah yeah, yeah that's gonna look great 
<laughs> and uh and uh and then it was green lit, lit and then we were moving to, the script was hilarious i read it the reason i was interested in the movie was when i read the script i got the script in like february of 99 maybe uh when i read the script the first scene was mom and apple pie cat dog chasing a cat exactly what you see in the movie mm -hmm. and then page three when the cat is lying on the road and the dog is creeping up to it wondering suspiciously like what's going on and starts sniffing the cat the cat goes Wah! and takes off and the dog turns and looks and he gets taken out by a van but i mean killed oh right. not right okay, okay. much darker it, but you know, yeah, then it's like, and, boom. and then it cuts to back then it was called fighting like cats and dogs and then it cuts to like a dog witnessing it across the street running into in in someone's house like you see the person and then you see the dog watching this and then he goes into his backyard into his dog house men in black opens up in the back of his dog house and it's the secret underground spy world of dogs we've got a problem uh, you know hq we've got a problem boom so, title sequence and it was so unexpected <laughs> It was such a great teaser. And I will tell you that when I first got hired to do the job and I met with Chris Tafaria, the, the executive producer, he said, mark my words, the very reason that you came on to do this movie is going to be the very first thing that gets taken out of the movie. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. Now, it's not to say they were wrong to do it because when we screened it, but because I wanted to make a movie that was The Terminator, but with cats and dogs. <laughs> okay and and make it really funny but satirical sure and maybe it would be pg-13 who knows i don't know i don't think it, there had been a rating but overwhelmingly it was going to be pg very quickly yeah and so we screened we screened it for an audience at uh, the focus group testing that included lots of kids and you don't see anything you just see the van coming and you cut wide and then you cut Mm -hmm. and dead silence after that. laughing 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 dead silence from the kids with their jaws open <laughs> and we're like okay we meet, we need to soften the blow of that <laughs> and make it fun and that's that's what that's what's in the movie and that was the right decision for the movie for the way the movie was platformed and released obviously sure i mean in terms of target audience that that seems like it would have been the yeah. right choice but i think we've, we've probably missed a step in the story of cats and dogs because mm -hmm. we've got like the the pitch you made with the reel you made and reading the script but how did all of this come to you in the first place yeah you come from ants how did the script get to you and all that sort of stuff that that, that first initial meeting yeah so the script i was gonna do curious george mm -hmm. that movie for um not for any lack of it being actually you know, we were in prep on it it was great but other things came up and then uh, the ability for a window for jim carrey to do the grinch for ron howard to direct and he was that's what universal was going to end up spending as their big tentpole that summer and so the movie was put on hold anyway the point being um and ron howard was a producer of curious george and he was amazing it was the best experience i ever had on a movie because he was a producer who had directed yeah so he understood what the challenges were and you know what we were doing but um my agent sent it to me among other scripts and there were several that were interesting but this one that scene made me ho hook me i was like okay this is cool the other thing that hooked me in the script was later on leading into the third act when mr tinkles the evil white cat says our day has come when it's leading into now we're going to take over this factory and we're going to we're going to implement our grand plan to take over the world. Um, there was a convergence of story elements at that point in the script that just hit just right. Mm -hmm. The timing, pacing of it, and got you really excited to get into the third act. And I was like, okay. And I just finished that script in no time. And I was like, okay, this would be cool to make. And then I met with the writer's managers. It was JC? It was uh, Chris Bender and JC Spink, and they they represented. John Requa and Glenn Ficarra and told them and also the producers were also Craig Perry and Warren Zide and Craig always talked about it being men in black with your pet mm, sure. and, yeah. and Ziff Robinow the executive at Warner's always called it babe meets the matrix 
Right. And so another another combination. Um, actually, when we were going to do the test, that test that I told you about, another possibility was this cat kind of prancing down the hallways of Warner Brothers and going into the executive's office and going up on the table like a totally normal cat and then suddenly going, God damn it. <laughs> Just <laughs> yelling at the executive to get the movie greenlit. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so so this I and then it it hit me like very almost immediately. This is one of those ideas that is just sitting right there to be plucked from the idea tree that nobody's made yet. Why haven't they made it yet? It's such an obvious idea. The secret war between the eternal battle between cats and dogs. That's actually a high tech spy movie. I mean, it's sort of like, OK, that's a movie, mm -hmm. right? You, you don't have to think too much about it. So. So I met with that group. They liked what I had to say. They brought me in to meet with Jeff Rabinov, the executive at Warner Brothers. He liked what I had to say. And then we started doing all the stuff you do where you're angling and doing work for free for a long time to try to put together the pieces to try to convince the powers that be to finance the movie. At one point, they financed some pre-production, but they hadn't greenlit the movie. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or or development and and visual development, art direction, some production design, some storyboarding, stuff like that, without green lighting the movie. Um, it wasn't until actually I I'll take it back when when they saw the animation test that I told you about earlier. They were like, yes, let's move forward, but there was still another hurdle because Warner Brothers was willing to finance I think half the budget, but they were looking for a partner. Right. And so to, to, to complete the financing and they went to DreamWorks and they gave the animation test to Spielberg that I had directed. And the feedback I got from Lorenzo de Bonaventura was that he loved that, that, that test I told you about earlier mm -hmm. from the mill. Um, but he wasn't quite sold on the second half of the script just yet. Then, then we, we they I guess they talked to Village Roadshow and they said we are liking the script, but it's not quite there yet. You need a female dog. <laughs> and so that's when Ivy, the character of Susan Sarandon, the old flame of Butch, was added in the script. Mm -hmm. And then they got on board. And so then it was Village Roadshow and Warner Brothers co financing the movie. And that got a green lit. And I have to ask about like the tone of that script. One thing you haven't or a name you haven't really mentioned is Joe Dante, which is what I kept thinking the whole time I was watching the movie was it felt like somewhat inspired by something like Gremlins. Was that being bandied about in terms of like a reference point or not at all at that at that moment? Right. Gremlins wasn't a reference point, but Joe Dante is a great reference. Um what else did he do? Inner space and what what was the movie before Gremlins that he did? What did he do? He did um uh well he did that sequence in the Twilight Zone film that was really effective. Okay. Um he done Piranha. Yeah, he's a great reference. Uh the filmmaking style. Yeah. Um, um the movie, yes, the movie Cats and Dogs had a little bit of bite, a little bit of edge here and there, not quite as much as Gremlins. No. I don't think. Um no no cats are exploding in microwave. <laughs> um but but um the biggest references were james bond and mission impossible and the terminator mm. and like the the action sequence in the middle where the russian cat is throwing these killing knives at at the, the butch and lou and uh the moment when the cat freezes the little russian cat freezes and the mom comes home and mm. all that was um first cut to music from the first terminator literally the actual music the, the temp music and it was hilarious um when we were posting it and doing the score on the stage and john debney is an amazing composer so i was like more intense <laughs> he was like <laughs> you know the, the percussion and everything and dun, 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 you know just and the studio is and they're like, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> no, 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 it needs to be Mickey Mouse music. It needs to be. And they were like suggesting stuff to him that was ridiculous. OK, so this guy, to his credit, a consummate professional, figured out how to balance my desire for it to be like it's it's an action sequence with the studio's desire to make it like kid friendly. 
and he found a i think a pretty good balance i mean he he um but but somewhere i have a i have probably some vhs tape somewhere that has you know all of those um you know in progress edits with temp music and stuff uh but but you know so there was that and then of course mission impossible and um and james the james bond movies i'm trying to think if i had i had written down a couple of references here actually let me see you know diamonds are forever what's his name blofeld his little white cat evil cat mm -hmm. um sort of a nod to some of the ken adams production design in those movies the <laughs> the the evil lair i mean we even had this thing which we, we couldn't afford but in the climax originally in the storyboards um <laughs> mr tinkles takes off in a pod like a a, a pod that flies you know a capsule sure yeah. sure yeah yeah and and remember the ninja cats were flying in on those on those remote control plane mm -hmm. radio controlled planes and so lou commandeers one in the burning in the factory's burning it's not it's not this flocking stuff it's fire the whole thing burning down everything's coming down mr tickles is trying to get away in his pod lou takes you know pushes one of the ninja cats off grabs one of those planes and takes off after this was when nobody did anything like this it wasn't like every movie that ever happened after 2003 or 2004 with where they were all flying all the time for 20 years of marvel movies and everything else mm -hmm. it was before anyone did that so he so he took off and was chasing down mr tinkles while the um you know scaffolding was falling falling down and fire was going and there's literally a beat where he's trying to jump from one to the other one one plane to the other and then this beam comes right and it was literally straight out of like raiders of the lost ark meets a great james bond teaser sequence so there was a big influence of obviously of the james bond films um you know i loved old finger when i was a kid i loved you know diamonds are forever i loved uh you know and then my favorite action sci-fi action movie of all time was the the first terminator so the shot that really jumped out to me was in ivy's first appearance where you shoot lou between the two legs of ivy oh <laughs> yeah that's funny because that was we we had um those were puppet legs mm, sure. uh, and, uh, just because there was a storyboard that had that shot and they're like we can't do that with the live dog we need to make puppet legs for the shot so it's kind of like think of there were like 127 animals in the film there were you know every different we, we even had a Peter Chesney was the visual effects sorry the practical effects supervisor he was on Hudsucker proxy on Raiders on like Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom he's old old school guy and he's the one who said look and they wouldn't let us do the fire sequence they thought it'd be too scary for kids sure. mm. so in, in the factory so he's the one who came up with this exploding Christmas tree flocking stuff mm. to kind of find a balance between jeopardy and terror <laughs> uh, in the climax. So, um, so he had to, they had to make like, I don't know how many thousands of gallons of whatever this stuff was that would then, you know, land everywhere. Um, but anyway, sorry, I got off track there. I did have like kind of a geeky question. The family yes. name is Brody. Is that a Jaws reference? No, I think it's a, uh, a reference to. Oh, jo I'm sorry, Jaws. Yes, it is Jaws. It is okay. Okay, yes, it is a Jaws. It made Cam yeah. stay there, but, but that was the right. It was the writers. I. It wasn't mine, but it was the writers. Yeah. Yes. You're talking to the, one of the world's largest Jaws fans right there. So you, you've just made Cam's <laughs> day. I think that's uh, that, that's nice yeah. to see. Well, Jaws. I I saw Spielberg, and I said I was. I mean, I I've met him a few times, but I went to see a screening of Jaws at Universal where he was talking for film school there mm. and I talked to him afterwards and um I couldn't help myself I was like I I, I routinely cite Dr. Strangelove as my favorite movie of all time but Jaws is up there like in the top five maybe maybe top three even. Mm -hmm. and I said man Jaws is the best movie ever to <laughs> him it's like such a what do they call it? A stand? Yeah, 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 so yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> thing to say. And I'm like, uh, no, it's not. See, you got to see more movies. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny, but it is one of the greatest movies of all time. I agree with you. Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Keeping the lights on at Spy Hard's HQ ain't cheap, and frankly, 
nor is feeding the school of attack piranhas. So we need your help. Roger that, Scott. Only at the Spy Hearts Patreon can you gain access to exclusive shows like Agents in the Field, which tackles non-spy films starring your favorite spy icons, and The Debrief, where we channel our inner solitaires and predict how the big spy movie news of today will impact tomorrow. So make like a Treadstone agent and activate your Patreon membership at patreon.com slash spyhards today. Cam, tell the people what we have in our sights this week. Scott, in honor of our annual pilgrimage, we are celebrating Vegas Month on the Patreon. First up, we are going to look at 1960s Ocean's Eleven, starring the Rat Pack. Hopefully this movie feels like the cinematic equivalent of hitting 21 again and again and again. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy chinks. I mean, yeah. to sort of like tracing back over a couple of things that you said. Uh, firstly, in terms of like the the spy references, we 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 pointed a lot of those out in the episode of our review earlier this week, and yeah, you know, it shows. Uh, maybe it comes from a bit of the writers, it comes from cinematography, it comes from yourself. But there's a lot of love of the spy genre built into this film and we've seen and dealt with quite a few sort of either like kids spy movies or satirical spy movies that perhaps treat the spy genre with a bit of sort of looking down on it from time to time but cats and dogs is one thing i can say it actually seems to appreciate the spy genre and it is using some of the tropes but it's doing it like with a tip of the hat instead of making a joke at its its, its expense i think you're 100 percent right that's another great observation um one of the things I said was, I will not shoot this movie like a 1950s Disney uh, live action TV short where the beaver is over there and the camera is over here and it's using a 300 millimeter lens mm -hmm. and they're narrating that the beaver is building the dam. You need to get right in there. You need to get right in there with the animals. You need to be at their eye level. I will not look down at them. And you need to feel like when the dog rounds a corner, it evokes the feeling of James Bond looking around the corner to see if anybody's there, whether it's uh, Daniel Craig or whoever it is, or, or Sean Connery. Um, and so here's the problem with that. Technical problem, or not a technical, an artist, an aesthetic problem maybe, or an aesthetic problem that needs to be solved. The size of a dog's head is no bigger than my balled up fist here. Mm -hmm. When you stick and when and what what did I wanted to do? I wanted to evoke the same feeling you get when you shoot a human looking around the corner or in a fight. Well, when you shoot a human face with a twenty seven millimeter lens, it has a certain because of its volume in space, it has a certain psychological effect on the viewer. If you use that same lens on a much smaller volume head, and don't forget volume is it's it's um what's the word? geometrically not linearly proportional so when you go down uh, 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 by half you're going down by an eighth of the volume right you get half of the length half of the height of the head like this mm -hmm. is only an eighth of the volume it's much less volume than the head what that does to the optics when the lens is shooting that doesn't do anything to the optics what happens is the effect that you get when that's projected on screen when you shoot a person with a 27 millimeter lens which is a somewhat intimate lens you feel like you're kind of right in there with the person it's a favorite of spielberg for example on a dog's much tinier head it feels like a 50 to 75 millimeter lens mm. which is a longer lens okay now if the way you're blocking the scene and choreographing it is you want to evoke a lot of near misses you want to have reveals within the shot you, you dolly over, you reveal someone watching, you boom down, they're holding a, a, record, a, you know, a, a, a gun in their hand. That swings around and the camera pans and rock focuses to someone in the background watching them. And you want to do it all in one shot. And you want to evoke the feeling you get when you see that in a spy movie. Mm -hmm. But with dogs, you have to change the entire lens palette. So instead of using a 27 millimeter lens, you have to use a 14 millimeter lens on the dog because it has a much smaller head. When you do that, because that was the goal to make you feel like you're right in there with them and it's a spy movie and the choreography is like that of a spy movie. When you do that, you're seeing the world with your camera. Now you have to light it completely differently because you're going to see all your lights and there is no 
hand painting that's going to take it out, that studio that's going to spend the money, and there's no AI, which, which, which would have been anachronistic to be able to use in 2001, that will simply, you can identify the light and remove it, right? And be in, in the entire shot, which is a, a crazy ability, but it's, it's doable now. So, um, so then you got to relight it. You got to, okay, how am I going to build the set? So we actually had raised sets so we could, uh, in, in the Brody house, so you could stick the camera on the ground, for example, because if you wanted to get a shot that was at the chest level of a dog or, or a kitten, mm -hmm. you had to be on the, on the deck. You had to be in the ground. And the camera lens had to be like half an inch above the ground to get a low angle on a cat instead of three feet to get a low angle on a six foot person, you know, sneaking around a hallway. So there's a whole series of tricks and, um, you know, uh, um, what, what, what I want to say, um, methodologies to the craft that we kind of had to develop as we went, as we were actually not as we went, as we were figuring it out up front. So we built the home and we built models of the home. I would take a little camera and shoot, um, you know, lipstick camera and shoot, shoot all the shots. And, uh, we didn't, we used a CG previs obviously for a bunch of the sequences that use CG. The sequence with the Russian cat took 11 days to shoot. Hmm. We shot in one direction for 11 days and in the other direction. But I shot the first unit in one direction. So then you have to change the lighting, lighting setup. Mm -hmm. And then the second unit shot in the other direction. So I kept going from first to second unit to make sure what they were covering would intercut with what I was shooting. So, so that was pretty complex because that mixed live action puppets, anima, you know, uh, CGI, everything, explosions, you know, you had to blow up blow up the living room and stuff um people in green screen suits and whatnot holding up puppets and so forth so that was um that one was pretty complex the logistics of making this movie sound incredibly complex to me <laughs> like figure out you know your balance of your cg puppetry real animals and then having to go through each shot and work through all these sequences first off like how do you find that balance when you're figuring out a sequence and then also like what was the most was the russian sequence the most challenging was there one that was more so um so the way to so first of all we storyboarded every single shot mm. every week in pre-production the budget would rise by 30 million dollars wow we would storyboard it and visual effects would take it and they would budget it and the budget of the movie was 60 million dollars but every week it would go to 90 million every single week for like six months and every then the rest of the next week i would cut down the shots to get because the visual effects budget was like almost half the budget of the movie sure, yeah. so it was yeah. like nine million. so i would so it would double every week and every week i would cut it back and then it would double again and i would cut it back why because we kept changing the script page new script pages would come in you know we found out we were able to use rhythm and hues for a visual effects house for one sequence and Phil Tippett's company for another sequence and so forth. So that was a, an incredible logistical challenge to get that. Meanwhile, they're scheduled, trying, we're trying to schedule, I'll give you an example of trying to schedule. Here's a couple of things. We had a little baby kitten. It was a Russian kitten. And you had to be a baby kitten because it would be much funny if you said, I think not baby Bobby, it is you who is in trouble, you know, and that was by the way, Glenn Ficarra, the writer <laughs> who had a very deep voice and he could do like Henry Kissinger. Well, that, that, scene was shot i don't know a month and a half into the shoot mm -hmm. the thing was only three weeks old so we had to plan to breed a cat that would be three weeks old that would be train train a bull mm -hmm. by the time we were going to shoot and we could not change the shoot date for some emergency because then the cat would be the wrong age <laughs> so 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 we did that and then we took square hands off of that cat and did the rest of this throwing knives and all that based on that but that sequence where he talks to the dog lou and warns him and hacks up a hairball that's the cat mixed with the puppet cat over the shoulder mixed with cg when he starts to stand up and and throw knives the other thing that was uh, complex was um two other things one was the um the the, the this was interesting the the men in black um command console that's in bush's the dog house um in his dog house the practical effects supervisor insisted that he do it with robotics 
instead of just some people in the back with puppeteering this thing opening and closing the doors you know star trek style with the doors opening and whatever and um it kept not working so we kept having to push that shoot for like two months and finally it's like okay it's gonna work and we came we all got there on the day and of course the dog trainers are terrified that the dog can be freaked out by the noises this thing is gonna make and so they go to do it I think they they tested the dog out a couple of times in front of it and it and it got used to it and then it said action and these things start moving and then the whole thing blew up <laughs> so we ended up having to we ended up having to do in the end with you know old school style um there's a lot of sort of creative intelligent craft and a lot of incredible craft people who understand how to pull pull the illusion off without having to resort to things that are going to be unreliable that are too sophisticated um, to do you know um and that's part of the the genius of the crew is that they understand how to um accommodate and how to be flexible um you know for those sequences i think the hardest sequence i mean they're all they're all pretty hard i think um maybe that sequence you were talking about the russian cat attack or maybe um the dogs in the the beagles in the barn that was a hard sequence to corral because we actually did have a bunch of beagles and trying to get them to <laughs> do what you want them to do and yeah not and how like shooting didn't just stop because you wanted to hug all the dogs because <laughs> i would have that problem I would. <laughs> they were cute you know you know we used they were grown-up dogs they weren't puppies um that's so that their actions could be repeatable mm. um I would use puppies actually in a couple of places if I could have at the time, um, but there wasn't any time to. I would have I would have insisted on it because they're just impossible to replicate. It's impossible. That's why they use them in commercials all the time. Um, but to be able to do it on an ongoing basis on a movie that's shooting for a hundred days, first unit and second. First of all, they're going to grow out of it, and secondly, you need really trained animals that are re repeatable. Every character had like four doubles so um if something didn't work on a particular day you know you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on that movie you can't have the animal decide it doesn't want to perform you have to have backups so, well you, you've led me on to one of the questions i had which is you know notoriously in cinema and in tv uh one of the hardest things to work with is animals that is i've heard that many many interviews and many 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 people and this is your first sort of big major film that you're the sort of director on and you've you've got all yeah. these dogs and cats and <laughs> all running around your set uh, how was that was there sort of difficulties in working with them but how were they in general to work with yeah by the way animals kids and water those are the That's three it. so um and there there's a kid in cats and dogs i had two out of the mm. three um they were great because we had this crack team Boone Nars animals for Hollywood and those trainers were great they they um had worked with animals they had he, he'd done tons of movies um and if I was asking for something they they got ahead of it mm -hmm. so we were training these animals for six months prior to the shoot of the movie I mean he demanded as much time as possible we were scouting for nine months to try to get the right animal so so casting them was hard mm -hmm. that was I would say that was harder than directing mm -hmm. actually was casting. um finding ones that I like the look of that he thought were trainable like this Anatolian Shepherd who plays Bush that's a Turkish Shepherd dog that's not a an American domesticated animal I mean domesticated but it's it's not a common the cats too cats are really you, you probably know cats are extremely hard to train they don't do anything yep. <laughs> you, you ask them so um but they they did amazingly well actually ultimately um we had a dog uh at the time a puppy a golden retriever and I remember bringing him to the dailies one day and he ran up to the screen barking at all the dogs <laughs> we had to keep we had to keep them away from the set they, the the trainers are very sure strict about that they didn't want any any other animals near the set um but yeah, they had a whole warehouse where they were training them all day long, every day for like six months before the shoot and during the shoot, just to make sure they would be able to deliver. It's uh, it's interesting because my you know I, we've been doing this show for three years. I have a greyhound, 
in the house, and this is the first time he sat and watched a spy film with me. Was was actually he actually why he, he actually was this at isn't the TV. even a joke. I'm being deadly serious. He sat there <laughs> and watched it for a good half an hour of just sat there just staring up at the screen watching the film. So uh, I think uh, my my dog Mac is definitely a fan of cats and dogs. You you've got his uh, poor print of approval. That's amazing. Maybe we can do like an experiment or something. <laughs> see <laughs> see which movies keep, keep canine attention. But yeah, best, best films for dogs. But you 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 actually segued me into my next question beautifully as well, which is casting. Because I mean, take the cats and dogs themselves out of it. You know, just look at your cast: Alec Baldwin, Tobey Maguire, Jeff Goldblum, Charlton Heston works on this film. Yes. All star lineup, and I think people forget about that a little bit when they think about this film because you just sort of think of the actual animals. But I mean, wow, what a coup! How did that all come together? That's uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's funny. So first, the live action actors. Mm -hmm. So when we were first casting it, this was my, in my head, I had the following actors. None of, none of these three were available. Um, and the ones who replaced them did an amazing job. But originally I had for, and he wasn't a star yet, Will Ferrell. He hadn't done Elf yet. Right. Okay. okay. So I had Will Ferrell as the dad, Julia Louise Dreyfus as the mom. And the reason I thought they would be great is you could believe that they'd be oblivious enough <laughs> to the fact that there's a secret war between cats and dogs going on right under their noses. Sure. That was and they've played a couple since, funnily enough. They've, they've played a, in a film. They've played a couple. What in in what? It was the remake of Force Majeure. Is it like Downfall? I think Downfall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Downfall. A couple of years ago, I think it came out. I've never seen. Never saw that. Okay, so that was. Neither of them were available then. Um, for Mister Tinkles, I was hellbent on Alan Rickman. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. We even we even did a test with Alan Rickman. I'm gonna play it for you guys. Your viewers won't be able to see it, but I'm gonna screen share and you can hear it. If that's okay, yeah. unless you don't want me, oh, that, I won't say no to that. Okay. <laughs> okay, hang on. Talk to me. Where are my detonators? The following people are to be released from their captors. In Northern Ireland, the seven members of the new Provo Front. What's the new Provo Front? I read about them in Time magazine. I was not expecting Alan Rickman to appear on this podcast, but I am no. thrilled yes. that he's here. Yes. So, so he was he couldn't do it because he was doing another Harry Potter film, mm. another another Warner Brothers film, Harry Potter. Um, <clears throat> By the way, Cats and Dogs, when Warner Brothers came out, because since you're in the UK for your edification, um, was the number one movie ever in the UK from as a Warner Brothers release when it came out. It was not that long thereafter replaced by Harry Potter. But up until that point, not, not number one movie ever in the UK, but of a Warner Brothers release, which I was shocked yeah. to hear. Um, so I guess the British love their pets. <laughs> uh, um, we do. And uh, to be fair, you had my money and my family's money in 2001 because we all went to go see this film. And there's five brothers and a mum and a dad. So that's seven tickets there. So there, there you, you go. go. There you go. Uh, so anyway, so, so he was doing Harry Potter. Sean Hayes came in to read for the part of the Calico, the one that John Lovitz eventually did. And then like, Sean, why don't you do... Mr. Tinkles, and he read for him, and he was hilarious. And so, and you can hear a little bit of Sean in Alan mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you watch that test. Um, and so that was him. Toby, great. Uh, how did we get him? I don't even remember. But he was shooting Spider Man at the same time, right? And so the first Spider Man, he came in one day to the sh to our recording session. He said, "I just." did this great scene where I, it's a scene where he's there's a bully or something in the high school and the, he gets hit and the food her food goes flying or something and he catches it with his tray yeah if you remember and he's like i caught it with my tray i caught all the stuff i actually caught it on film it wasn't with effects at all there's no cg nothing he was all excited anyway he was great and then um who else alec Baldwin is great he's like he was the best actor i've ever worked with he was three takes at most 
and you didn't need anything else. And usually it was on the first take. He hmm. just nailed, nailed it. He was fantastic. And um, although this is interesting at the time, when we were trying to cast it, I was meeting at many different agencies and the agents were pitching their actors. And one agent who is Scottish, a guy named Darren Statt, I don't know if you've heard of him, very thick Scottish brogue. He's like, you've got to take my, you know, my client, the rock. <laughs> <Kept saying. laughs> and it was, and it was um, Dwayne Johnson. Nobody knew he, he was a wrestler. That was it. He was nobody. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And he was the most passionate agent I've ever, he was in a room. Let me just say this. He was in a room full of, it was UTA, big agency, like 30 agents pitching all their clients. And in front of all the other agents who were his colleagues, he was essentially, they were suggesting other actors and he just kept squashing it and saying, you got to take the rock. He's amazing. He's going to be a huge star. I've never seen an agent lobby. It was like Jerry Maguire. I've never seen an agent <laughs> lobby for their, for their, for their client that aggressively and that passionately. So, and uh, he probably, he would have been great too. I mean, he, he would have been, he would have been excellent in the film, but, but Baldwin was great. And, um, who was the rock to play theoretically? The same, the character that Alec Baldwin. He, they, were, right. they, were Butch. they were pushing him for Butch. Right. And he would have been great. He would have been great. I mean, Baldwin is maybe a little gruffer mm. sounding, a little, a little more. He's he's been around the block a little bit more, at least at that point. Grizzled in his career. Um, grizzled exactly. Um, and then, so who else was in it? Then uh, Susan Sarandon yep. for Ivy. She was, she was lovely. And then uh, and Charlton Heston. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, that came up because someone who worked at Warner Brothers, Fraser Heston is his son. And he was in post-production at Warner Brothers. And somehow the producer brought out, I said, what do you think about Charlton Heston? What do you mean? My favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time, Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, of course, had this, you know, my um, among my favorites when I was a kid, Soylent Green and the Omega Man and all his, and Ten Commandments, everything. And then later in, toward, in college and film school, Touch of Evil, I'm like, yes, Charlton Heston. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And so, yeah, that was amazing. We went up to his house and recorded. It's the house where in the Michael Moore documentary, Bowling for Columbine, if you ever saw mm -hmm. it, he mm -hmm. goes to interview Charlton Heston and he sort of bait and switches him. It's not very nice. Um, but anyway, it's that house and up on Mulholland and we went there and recorded him and he, he couldn't have been, he was amazing. Yeah. And he signed my, he signed my Soylent Green poster. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> so. awesome. I had a question just about the live action actors, like the ones you're working with on the set. Like this is a very complicated shoot. Is it difficult to get, you know, your performances from your actors and maybe even leave a little bit of room for improvisation if you're dealing with say like a Jeff Goldblum when you have so many moving parts around you? Only when the animals weren't in shot. Yeah. Which was most of the time. I mean, we we would split the screen or we would do overs and we would use a double or we would use a puppet in the foreground of the animal and then the person looking at it and it'd be out of focus so you couldn't tell um but um <laughs> yeah there probably could have been more improving done i would think um there's a little bit where goldblum improvs he's sending his kid off to play soccer or something and he's sitting on the steps and he, he improvs a little ditty hmm. that he, he made that up and you know but it was a very controlled movie i mean it, it was very carefully done so there wasn't as much probably acting improv it, there was some improv when elizabeth perkins who's great puts the the boy to bed at night and she tickles him and everything mm. and then there was sort of actual actual improv when the boy is playing with the dog in the backyard and they're jumping and we we had a camera shot we were doing but we we, we allowed for a little looseness but and the, and so it felt like they were really playing and because they were mm -hmm. um and but but you're right that, um, yeah, that kind of movie, you know, you want to stay on budget and on time. <laughs> yeah. And the city of Happy. So they were, you know, and we did, you know, by, by the end of the shoot, we were scrambling to pick up as much coverage as we could. We had like five or six units running, literally like junior guerrilla units. Like if you're making a student film, we would send out someone with a camera to grab stuff. I mean, it was chaos, <laughs> but we got it. So. But it was it was like uh, you know I'd I'd go to sleep at one a.m. I wake up at five every day for a hundred days you know for like six months or how long is a hundred no that's four and a half months of shooting mm -hmm. 
and then prior to that all the prep so it was yeah it was pretty intense but, but great like thrilling and fulfilling well you've you've thrown a curveball at us with the alan rickman clip and larry you're striking me as a man who's done some prep work for this so i'd be remiss if i didn't uh-huh. set you up is there anything else you're sort of sort of saving for us any sort of nuggets you've prepared to any bombs you've got <laughs> to drop on us that we may not ask the right question to prompt not no nuggets in terms of something like that but just some points that might be interesting. Sure, go ahead. Um, Phil Tippett and Rhythm and Hughes were the main visual effects houses. Mm-hmm. There were other companies. Tippett is famous. You know, he did uh, Starship Troopers, but he did Robocop, the Ed 209, and he did the test, the famous test for Jurassic Park of the Raptors in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. It was a stop motion test. And every shot in that test is literally the same in the movie, except with CG instead of but but the shot design the lenses and the choreography is identical i've never seen that just about I've never seen that test you can find that online just look wow. it up yeah. it's really cool. cool really cool but it's stop motion because they were thinking they were going to do stop motion and then they realized we can do it in cgi and it was a big breakthrough he had an animator named davi i forget his last name i could tell whenever davi because when you do animation either for a, an animated feature or for visual effects and it's character animation different animators are assigned different shots the animators are actors mm-hmm. right they're just inhabiting the role of that CGI character and this guy somehow got inside this Russian cat <laughs> so when you see that cat holding the knife and he's going like this breathing while the woman comes in behind him and like fr- frozen mm-hmm. and everybody laughs every time that's Davi he brought that character to life and whenever he and he did some other shots and we didn't have them in the movie because there was no room in the scene it was so great and so funny and and brought to life that character so well that I always was like you know you can't have everything all the time but you but you like to have a certain percentage of the shots be as good as they can possibly be without going over budget Mm. and I would always ask for him whenever we had a chance to plus something or make it better because he was great um and the yeah and the the I would say maybe the practical effects, production design. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So the doghouse is like three feet wide, but you see the dog pacing left and right, mm-hmm. and it's a four foot long dog. And so what's interesting about that is perceptually, it's not like people go, oh my God, how is the dog pacing in the house? That's ridiculous. That's absurd. They just buy yeah. it because you're inside that space. And so the size and the scale of that house kept changing depending on our need uh, on the inside whenever we had different shots in that doghouse. So that's kind of interesting. There had multiple size doghouses. So that's kind of interesting. The other thing was, um, so this is interesting. When I did the press jockey for this movie, mm-hmm. something hit me that I was, was a curveball to me and I was not expecting it. Some of the reporters said, how do you feel about how you depicted cats in this movie? Right. They were angry. <laughs> I was like, it's a friggin' movie about cats and dogs. <laughs> 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 oh, like what? They were genuinely irate. There was a review somewhere that said it was irate about something like Guterman knows nothing about the holy mysteries of the common tabby cat. <laughs> Excuse me? Like that that critic needs to get out a little bit. Right. And so to get a dog. Right, or to get a dog. So before we started, I found the so Warner Brothers sends you a packet, a PR packet mm. of the reviews. Now the reviews were Rotten Tomatoes are around 55% positive or something. I think it's now 53 or 54 or something. So a little over half positive and the other half not as positive, right? And so I went, I, mean, what, what? I never looked at the reviews ever mm. when I only recently looked at them for something else because there was a documentary and they wanted it about Charlton Heston huh. and in France. And so I did some, I, I answered it and then I looked up some of the reviews because I had some of the material. And the New York Times said it was exuberant fun. The BBC said both succeeds as both a parody of the spy genre and in stretching what you believe is possible. Mm-hmm. Entertainment Weekly called the Russian cat attack the it sequence of the summer. So they did a profile on the sequence. The Chicago, but these I hadn't seen. The Chicago Daily Herald. Listen to this. <laughs> I'm 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 not I'm I'm saying this because you have you have critics who watch a movie and 47% of them are not positive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then the ones who are positive say things like director Lawrence Guterman who handled several sequences in Ants 
demonstrates an amazing command of his craft here. He whips the movie through a racing pace as if you watch the screen carefully, you'll see how ingeniously he has placed the camera, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm like, okay, that's pretty good. Then a couple of other really good ones, especially about the directing, and then the Time Out New York. This is interesting to me because this brings, like the critic appreciates film, but is discerning. Mm. And they wrote, alternately brilliant and cloying. Okay. <laughs> there are moments in Cats and Dogs that couldn't be more inspired. The opening sequence alone, in which a worldwide network of dog operatives is called into action, is worth the price of admission. Cats provides frustrating glimpses of how good kids' movies could be if only there weren't any damn kids to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tell. Okay. And I think that's telling if you think about my point about the Terminator. Mm. So, so my point is not to toot my own horn. My point is to say finding the right balance of tone mm -hmm. for something that's supposed to be evocative, an homage to spy films, not looking down my nose at it, entertaining for kids and adults at the same time. There were some things in there we would have put in, like this was interesting, this got taken out, would have been fun. When the cat is planting bombs on the on the Mr. Brody's lab door, he's planting plastique. Mm -hmm with C4 and he's going to blow it up. Um, he's muttering gibberish Russian to himself. And the assistant editor came up with hilarious subtitle dialogue to put there for the gibberish Russian, you know, right. from this American technology, blah, 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 something or other. I don't remember. He had like a whole bunch of very funny lines. And I was like, this is great. This adds a whole other layer to the moment so adults can enjoy it too, not just mm -hmm. kids. And it was very, it was very sort of clever. Um, and I remember one of the people at the studio saying, you, you can't do this. Kids don't read. And I'm like, what? What do you mean kids don't read? A, B, so what if they, even if they don't, even if maybe your kids don't read, I mean, they're like, adults will read it and it doesn't matter. The kids will get the visual part. It has no bearing on. And if you look today, everyone reads everything. Everyone uses captions on every single thing that they look at, whether it's TikTok or, mm -hmm. or a TV shows or whatever. So, um, so, you know, you can't always get everything, but, but I think, you know, finding that balance and I get people coming up to me all the time saying that was like my favorite movie from when I was a kid, you know, who are 25 now or whatever. Um, so, you know, it, it's a, it's a solid, um, it was certainly a, uh, what's the word profitable film. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. It made money even after all the other, uh, you know, even after the marketing spend and distribution costs and everything. Um, yeah, it was a, it was an experience. It's funny. Um, it's funny to think of like just how spoiled we were in 2001 when it comes to spy kids films, you think of cats and dogs and spy kids in the same year. That's right. Both you and Rodriguez. I, I've said this on the podcast, treated the source material with respect. And you look at, unfortunately, some of the, spy kid sequels uh, maybe not so much but hey ho i think that studio interference a little bit there too and uh and, and that's kind of what happens with it but you know i i had a couple of quick questions about sort of cats and dogs as like a more of a, a macro sense as the sort of postscript on the film a little bit um mm -hmm. i mean looking back on it now you say you've been asked about it since people have come up to you and mentioned cats and dogs looking back on your experience with the film what was sort of your fondest memory of putting that film together a couple of moments probably mm -hmm. Probably the moment, the moment that we showed the test. Sure. And, yeah. And, and they all laughed and I thought, okay, we're going to be able to make a movie. And then either when I first got onto the sets in prep or like the first day of shooting, when I realized, okay, <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> there's no turning back. We're making this yeah, movie. Yeah. 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 That was, and then actually the last day of shooting was great. We were shooting the scene where, where Miriam Margulies, who, by the way, if you look at the news, just posed nude in. She did, and she looks tremendous. Somewhere, some British magazine or something. I don't. I know. think it's Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair. Okay, so she played the the maid. Mm -hmm. Um, she's washing Mister Tinkles in the tub, and, or you know, in the sink, and he's thinking, you know, he's growling about it or something, and then he says send in the ninjas or something like that <laughs> and uh 
that was not a hard i it was a beautiful set i liked the lighting uh it was the last day we executed it quickly and well it was fun to do one other thing i really liked you guys don't oh here oh here's a tidbit well you can probably see it if you ever see the dvd but it's probably online there's an alternate ending for the movie mm. so the original ending for the movie was the following they're playing soccer everything's copacetic with the family and then it fades up and mr tinkles is being taken to a cat like sanitarium type place right to get snipped mm. by sophie the maid in a cage and she goes in and she's looking around in this in this sort of it was a big hot it was a former sanitarium in vancouver okay yeah and she's looking around and it says paging dr katz paging dr katz and then she's looking around she looks over and there's a nurse sitting at the front desk who wasn't there a second ago and she goes over to the nurse she says oh i have mr tinkles he's here for his sneep sneep he's sneep sneep he's been a very bad kitty try to take over the world and she nods like this. She's got like a Stepford wife smile on her face. And then her head falls back and opens up and a bunch of cats pour out. <laughs> oh, geez. And surround her and she's freaked out. And, and then you push into the cage and the door is open and Mr. Tinkles has been released. And then it pushes into Mr. Tinkles on the front in the front of the hospital, laughing diabolically. <clears throat> Excuse me, with like one eye, kind of like that character in the Pink Panther who kind of blinks one eye i forget his Dreyfus. name yeah the herbert lom character yeah herbert lom right and then it cuts from black to pushing in lou lou pushes and we got a problem and then it cuts to all five dogs in slow motion straight out of reservoir dogs mm. long <laughs> lens like 300 millimeter lens walking next to each other like this with music going dun, 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 like onto the next adventure i don't know why but the studio didn't want to use that so we went back and reshot the whole ending where Mr. Tinkles is brought by Sophie to her sisters to put different and puts different uniforms on him, which is funny and always gets a big laugh in the theater. So that was great, too. What I liked about shooting that scene was we were down in L.A. and it was a reshoot and the crew was an L.A. crew. Those people have been doing it for 100 years right and more mm -hmm. and they were it was so easy to shoot with and get that i was like okay now we're going to use the jib arm to do this like okay do it and then they did it mm -hmm. and then it was done and i didn't have to think about it now we're going to do that okay they, and they did it they lit it they painted the set that morning it was perfect like everything went without a hitch in a way that um and i'm sure that's the case now in vancouver but back then it was early days in vancouver mm -hmm. so the crew you only had like three you only had like two crews that were in, good enough to do a hollywood studio film now uh, you know toronto vancouver everywhere montreal but back then it was sort of early and when i got back to la i couldn't believe how like the calculation the studio would make back then was what's gonna we're gonna get a rebate tax rebate in canada we're gonna get the, the exchange rate but uh but now um uh but but but, but they don't take into account like all the intangible stuff like how fast the crew is going to work and how they can be able to execute what the director wants effectively and get the vision on the screen so i think that's much less of an issue now yeah. and the crew was great on cats and dogs don't get me wrong but i remember coming back and thinking holy cow like it was impressive yeah no kidding and i i did have a question that like this movie was a solid earner it's shocking to me that it took like nine years for a sequel to roll around did anyone ever talk to you about a follow-up yeah there was some conversations about it actually and then i don't know why because i was off doing i was going to do a movie for miramax it was uh artemis fowl which was uh, like uh based on a series of kids books i don't know if yeah, you know. yeah yeah, yeah the, uh, kenneth brona did the film ultimately yeah an irish author kenneth brona directed exactly eventually like a long time later yeah um uh, and I was going to do another thing. And then, uh, yeah, and then I think I was doing, I can't remember what I was doing when I was going to do a TV show at one point. And then that's when the 2008 was when they were going to maybe do a sequel or 2007. And then they went ahead with it. And I was, yeah, but yeah, it was, it was a, 
it was a good hit. I mean, it was a profitable. It's the first movie mentioned in their annual report <laughs> in whatever 2001's <laughs> annual report or something. So you know that means something, right? Like, yeah, at least to the people, the bean counters. So, um, yeah. Huh. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I think Cam sort of stole my final question on, on cats and dogs. So I'll, I'll pivot with sort of a, a slightly different one. And, and this is maybe will bounce off maybe to questions of further films. What did you learn from the process of making Cats and Dogs? Well, I learned how to make a movie because mm -hmm. I was in the trenches for all that time. Um, I learned that, well, I knew it somewhat, but I, it was reinforced on that movie and every movie that so much is at stake, mm -hmm. so much money, so much time, effort, reputation, and so forth, that the politics of interacting in that system consumes a huge amount of energy mm, yeah uh, that is you're not throwing your creative energy at the movie at the rate that you would probably like to be which with an artist or a creative person or a director or a writer is 110 mm percent -hmm, mm -hmm. you have you, that's all you want to do you have to spend a lot of energy keeping the studio happy keeping the crew happy keeping the uh, division department heads happy keeping the producers happy keeping the actors happy and getting the best you can out of them mm -hmm. and i suppose then uh, i want to sort of talk about the, what came after cats and dogs now you know one thing you said quite early on in this discussion was there's a lot of things people in hollywood work on that isn't necessarily on their imdb page we've had people on the show before that had like two credits to their name but have been working solidly for 30 years like it, it, you know, yeah, it, it's crazy when you think about what's actually going on behind the IMDb screen. But th That's right. the next credit that you've got on uh, IMDb, which I think is probably the, the next film you're known for, is the sequel to The Mask, 2005's Son of the Mask. And right. now that film is going to turn 20 in a, sort of about a year and a half. And I just sort of wanted to... It, it's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted yeah. to ask you like your thoughts looking back on, on that project. Yeah, um, no, that's a good question. Um, you're right. If you looked at my actual resume, there's a ton of other stuff that doesn't appear on IMDb because mm -hmm. it doesn't get really interesting projects, um, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and for one reason or another, you know, the stars have to align. Um, the Son of the Mask is interesting because well, that's a whole story. I could do a whole other podcast <laughs> with you about that. But, um, but just, just to kind of keep it short um the genesis of that was i met with new line on another movie and um didn't end up doing it and this movie came up and they were really eager to have me do it and i said oh that's cool i love the mask yeah. will there be jim carrey and they said probably not i'm like okay i'm not interested <laughs> <laughs> and then they said no 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 this is what we're gonna do I said, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't PG-13. And they said, yes, absolutely. A thousand percent. It's going to be PG-13. I said, well, I need to be able to compensate for the fact that there's no Jim Carrey in the movie. So I need to be able to do A, B, C, and D, and E. Yes, we're going to do all that. <laughs> so, so what happened was we made the movie. And there's a good movie in there, mm -hmm. actually. and. Um, but when the rating, the marketing department changed the rating to PG from PG 13 mm. and the movie was filmed in a kind of aggressive PG 13 style, but it with, with the entire layer of count ironic counterpoint to the visuals was stripped and all of the nuance of the relationship, the adult relationship was stripped out of the film and the emphasis became this baby fighting a dog. That wasn't the tone mm. that right. was being. That it was part of the very careful balancing act to try to execute it and to replace the fact that there was no Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. right. And and all along the feeling was no, no, we're making a separate movie. Almost like these days, it's nothing. It's like okay, you do a different thing in the universe of that world. It's a different mask movie with different people. It's about a family, not about this guy. It's not the sequel to. So you had these expectations of all the fans of the young fans on IMDb of the first movie who were like, no, Jim Carrey, what a piece of garbage. <laughs> like, 
just out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then separate from that, you had an attempt to cobble together something and stripped out all the PG-13 and the layers of comic, comic, ironic counterpoint satire that actually made it appealing to adults and not just 13 year olds. And so you were marketing a movie to kids where the intent was PG-13, but where you had taken out anything PG-13 and you're left with something I knew wasn't going to work mm-hmm. well before the movie was released mm-hmm. well before. And I was working on post-production on it for a long while. It turns out that there was a cut in 2004 that was intended to be a director's cut, a second director's cut. Directors typically from the director's going to get two cuts. Mm-hmm. There wasn't enough time to do anything with that cut because they pulled the, the screen, the release date up and we needed to work like around the clock to, to meet that date. Sure. Right. So unfortunately, even though everyone had good intentions, that one has a lot of inspired stuff in it in different places, but because of the stripping out of the layers, it didn't play. It'd kind of be like having, I don't know, like if you had Dumb and Dumber, right? But you didn't have like Jim Carrey. Remember he cries at the beginning of the movie with Jeff Daniels. Mm-hmm. He says, I just want someone to love, right? Right. There's no movie. Without that moment, there's no movie. Period. It's just a bunch of guys doing dumb stuff. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's a movie, but it's not, it won't hold, you're not engaged. You're not emotionally connected to this guy. You don't root for him. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel it's just a jerk. Yeah. Without that. You know, if all he does is put barbecue sauce in people's, <laughs> you know, drinks or whatever, whatever that scene is. So um, that was a carefully crafted film. I mean, the, the comedy was between emotion and comedy and, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Slapstick and whatever. So um, that was heartbreaking because it was, I think, an order of magnitude more accomplished technically, for example, than Cats and Dogs um, and visually. And just didn't land mm. the way it was intended to so mm. yeah well I, yeah i'm sorry if, if... But, but, but listen but listen that's that's the movie business like there's no version of like i'm not complaining or anything that that's like you go in with your eyes wide open mm-hmm. it's like you're in the major leagues you deal with what happens in the major leagues yeah 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 and that's and you can't you can't you know you win some, you lose some. There's luck. There isn't luck. I mean, you you give it your best. You know, all you can do, really, is do your best. Do your best work. So, I I, I firstly I agree, and I think it's yeah. It, it, sorry for if if it's like a sore subject to bring up, but I think it was an important topic to sort of discuss the film because it's part of your legacy with cinema. Like it's something that you contribute, even if that didn't quite land as well as you wanted it to. And it's interesting talking about like how it could have been perceived because if you look at what Jumanji did for instance, that is, it's basically a board and it's passed between two different films, the Robin Williams film and the Rock film, but they are not the same. Right. And nor are they compared to each other. They're completely different. But these, Son of the Mask and the Mask, are just, they're, they're treated as like a, a sequel to one another, which is, it's yeah, not. It's yeah. a, it's the, the mask falls to someone else. It was never intended to be, but that's how it was marketed. Mm. Jumanji, uh, many more years passed in between the two. Yeah. People who liked Jumanji when they were kids didn't even we're like 40 by the time the mm. movie came out you're you telling know, me the second one <laughs> i mean i mean so the mask on the other hand was like nine years or something or yeah. 11 or 10 years or whatever it was and so there was still a, re- a residual love of that first film which is great i mean hilarious jim carrey is a genius to end all geniuses in terms of physical comedy you can't even believe what he mm. does you go back and look at it so there was no way to pop that the only thing we could do was try to say okay it's a different movie mm-hmm. It's about this family, this dad who's struggling between fatherhood and work and career. That's a totally different theme than a guy who's trying to get a girl who's a nebbish, you know, and he wants to get the hot girl. I mean, it's, it's not even like in the same universe of themes, mm-hmm. right? And so, yeah, it, but it is, uh, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a badge of honor in a way because it's something that um, we've we've tackled before on the show. We spoke with the director of 1996's, or 1998, sorry, is The Avengers, Jeremiah Chechik, who, of course, 
made um i think national lampoon's christmas vacation ah. um and he had a very good film in the avengers and then the studio came in and chopped 25 minutes off of it completely removed the sort of foundation of the plot yeah and what you were left with was a 90 minute farce that no one understood yeah yeah and well that's that happened that part by the way that happened in son of the mask also because the premise of the movie was a baby was born of the mask and the sequence at least not in europe but in the us in north america the sequence that shows that which is the a mask version of sperm yeah which is really mm -hmm. but not appropriate for five-year-olds but appropriate for pg-13 is not in the movie so that's like the plot point that sets the movie in motion that's missing from the movie that's similar to that the other movie i was thinking i haven't seen both but i've seen bits and pieces was the the zack snyder cuts of of uh, justice mm -hmm. league where i saw a sequence uh, in a bank robbery or something and i saw them side by side on youtube and it's clear that zack snyder's version is better yeah than what was in the movie originally. I mean, I haven't seen the entire movie, but that's interesting about Jeremiah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and we had the screenwriter of the Avengers on as well, who you know showed us like the screenplay and like night and day versus night what day. the intention was versus what wound up on the screen. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's that happens, and then you get it's art and commerce, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you get you know you, you have a, you have a director and they're a perfectionist if they're any good and most of them are mm -hmm. nobody sets out to make a bad movie is the old trope they want to be they want to perfect it and then you come in and you I mean you've seen the <laughs> you've seen the the um story about touch of evil yeah and have, have you heard Orson Welles talk about it in the 58 pages of notes and everything that he gave mm -hmm. <laughs> the way they cut it and it's like you know that's your baby you want to you want to make this thing you're giving birth to this thing that you created and that you perfected and then you come in and hack stuff out for some <laughs> random reason. then you can't and by the way there's never a good the rationale is never particularly good mm. yeah it's not like it's not like there are artists who became studio executives mm. they're studio executives Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 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 they're very smart people don't get me wrong extremely smart and and some of them are bang on right about what they're doing I'm not saying but some of them unless you've actually been there and may have been in the trenches you can't know what it is and you can't know what the intent is so sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you know you just you kind of m making a movie is filled with thousands and thousands of decisions and if you know two are wrong and those are ones that have a high weighting on the scale, mm. then you could be in trouble, mm -hmm. right? So. Well, Larry, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us home. I've got two questions left for you. Okay. The first question is, you know, what is it? You know, we we spoke about two of your major films. What is it you're sort of working on at the moment? What is it you're up to? So right now, I actually what's interesting is so I told you about my hearing. So I have hearing loss, and it started to deteriorate. So while I was in prep on a movie an animated feature that was going to supposed to go with relativity films, but then they went bankrupt. Um, I had started a technology startup and that startup um, personalizes the sound using digital signal processing, personalizes the sound on the phone and on computers for people with hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So they don't, so for those use cases, they don't have to use a hearing aid. And if that's their main problem, they don't have to spend $8,000 on a pair of hearing aids. They can, Mm -hmm. spend a lot less and get and so it basically takes the the hearing prescription that you would get mm -hmm. so to speak if you went to an audiologist and puts it in the software um and it's great it works great so that's what i've been working on lately um so i'm not working on film stuff right now um but the last thing i did was i was an executive producer on a movie called remember mm -hmm. which starred mm -hmm. Chris Plummer and Martin Landau came out in 2016, I think, or 2015. Um, directed by Adam McGoyan, the well-known Canadian director. Yep. Um, a drama, dramatic thriller, nothing to do. The reason I was involved in that is I was working with the writer on something else, and he sent me the script, and I thought it was a great script. And I got it to some folks in Canada and helped get them helped them get it set up. Well, that... A couple of people in my family, my parents included, have hearing issues, some quite severe. So I appreciate the work you're doing in that field, actually, because I, 
Thank you. It's uh, people should be fighting that sort of fight. Uh, not just that, but in all sorts of things, trying to help our fellow human beings. So I appreciate that. Just personally, just I appreciate you. you doing that. And the last question, which is far sillier, but it's how we end the show. For every single person we've had on the show, from the very start with Nicholas Meyer, straight through to you, Larry Guterman. What is your favorite spy movie of all time? Would you, uh, so you would not count to just we got to rule out Doctor Strange Love because that's not really a spy movie. Well, we have it on our list because it's kind of got like a, an edge to it. But like, I, if we're going to go with more like direct spy movies, I, I say take that off. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I should have thought of that before I came well, on. We the don't show. like prepping people for it. We like sort of catching you <laughs> with, your, with, your, with your pants down. Oh, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some spy movies that I like, and then I'll try to winnow it down. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, would you consider the lives of others a spy yeah. movie or yeah, yeah. a drama? That's, that's a spy. Yeah, it counts. Okay, so that's a great. I love that movie. Um, I love. Um, I mean, I love Goldfinger. I love uh, Diamonds Are Forever. I love um, Doctor Strange. Love. I love Doctor Strange. Love is my favorite movie of all time. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to take that, it, that's fine. That, that, that's it's a good that answer. Category, then, then that would be it. There are spy characters. It counts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other that I would say. Is there any more modern, perhaps? You've got lots sort of like the 60s there. Yeah, I do like the Born Identity movies. I like the Born Identity. I like it. Um, would you consider that a spy movie? Yes, right? Oh, absolutely. Definitely. It actually celebrated its okay. uh, 21st birthday yesterday of time of recording. Okay. There you go. Um, and Doug Lyman was in my class at film school. So there oh, you wow. go. Uh, I mean, I, I just saw Skyfall not long ago, and that was pretty good. I like, uh, but I, I, there's got to be something better. So The Lives of Others, I think, is really good. Popular pick, yeah. I mean, you start counting the Hitchcock films. They come up a lot. There's a lot of spy movies he did. Like, there's, They're pretty classic. Yeah, I like North by Northwest. Yeah. I mean, would that be considered a spy movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. North by Northwest, yeah. Notorious, 39 Steps. He's done quite a few. Yeah. Help me out with some others. I mean, <laughs> we've got hundreds <laughs> on our list. Uh, Literally the hundreds. Conversation. Um, a couple of contemporary ones. Okay, contemporary. Um, cause I, mean, I was going to say Conversation is very popular from the 70s, but uh, more contemporary. Spy Game. So you've got the Tony Scott film Spy Game. Uh, Did you say the, uh, Spy Game? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going i mean i enjoyed i enjoyed sneakers by the sneakers way sneakers is great yeah. Uh, yeah i um i i like uh now the crime game is not considered that's not considered a spy movie no no, no. yeah if you want like more action stuff you got like true lies with sort of schwarzenegger in the 90s that's a good one yeah i like true lies the mission impossibles obviously that whole series yeah the mission impossible movies but they're all really good. Mm -hmm. Actually, I do like the first Mission Impossible, and I love the Brian De Palma set piece in the room mm -hmm. where he's hanging yeah. in the room. That's a iconic, iconic and memorable set piece. Uh, you know, straight out of Hitchcock. Uh, I'm sorry, it's crazy that I didn't think of this before. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd like to catch you off guard because it means like you have to dig for an answer. And I honestly, I think your, yeah. all your roads are leading you right back to Doctor Strange, though. I feel that sort of energy coming from you, that, that that is your heart's pick. It is. And I think that's a perfectly fine pick. I think uh, many people listening will be like, yep, yeah, I'm with you there. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got there. Uh, Larry, I want to thank you for many things, for taking the time to talk to us today, for your honesty, for your generosity, and for Cats and Dogs, because we both really enjoyed the film. So... There's a lot of thanks to be had, but honestly, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you. There you go, folks. That was our chat with Mr. Larry Guterman. And firstly, I want to thank Larry once again for taking the time to talk to us all about his film and his wider filmography. A massive interview with a lot of insight into this film. If you're a Cats and Dogs fan, this is a veritable feast for you. Uh, I also just want to point out that, that, as we sort of mentioned earlier on this week, this is our third anniversary three years of spy hards which means if you're a first time listener that's three whole years worth of a back catalog to tune into spy movie reviews and interviews galore pussy galore perhaps and if you like what you heard on this interview please hit that subscribe button to stay with us on our journey to decode all the spy movies ever made but uh, i think let's talk about this interview cam 
I think it was one of the most insightful ones we've done. And it's really great to talk to a director that is passionate about the work they've done and can really sort of tell the story from beginning to end of how that film was made. This was a really fantastic chat. And I think Larry's passion for this project really came across. And it was just fascinating to hear someone take us kind of on a journey over the course of their career, how all the pieces kind of fell one after another to make something like Cats and Dogs feel like such a natural evolution of their creative process. And I mean, for me, one of the most interesting things to hear him talk about was the Kung Fu Cat um, test that they put together as a basically proof of concept to the studio. And that sequence is largely um, carried over into the film. But the way that like that was so crucial to making the movie something that a studio could look at and say, this could be a real movie. I found that entire breakdown that he gave us just absolutely fascinating insider stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, we we weren't exactly like fawning over cats and dogs in its every sort of way in our review. Like We had our criticisms of it, too, for sure. But as we said, the, the special effects, the, the computer graphics that we use, the puppetry that we use, this was some sort of, you know, some breaking edge stuff. This was, you know, frontier sort of CG effects, really. And they had to sort of prove what they could do. And obviously the proof was in the pudding. It won over the execs. And the film is here as a shining example of what someone can do, the right person in the right place at the right time. Larry's entire career led him to this film. And I think it shows in the finished product. And, you know, again, people might sort of look on this film and maybe even slightly dismiss it in certain ways. It's like, oh, it's just a a kid's film. And in many ways, it it is a kid's film, but it's doing a lot of things that, you know, you look at some of its contemporaries, you look at 2002's Die Another Day, none of the computer graphics in that film stand up to anything they're doing in Cats and Dogs. No. And that's that's a Bond film. That's a Bond film with like quadruple the budget of this film so you've just got to tip your hat to larry on that one and the team of course that worked with him to achieve the look of this film but also you know as you said like some might dismiss it as like a kid's film but when you look at actually what he has to go through to achieve what winds up on the screen this is one of the most technically challenging films i think we've ever talked to a filmmaker about yeah you think about all of the plates that were being spun at the same time just talk like a normal director's job. You've got all the sort of toing and froing, directing traffic, and also directing a scene itself as well. Actors, props, explosions, stunt work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This film's got all of that, and it's got puppetry, and it's got animals, and it's got computer graphics at the same time. And this is basically Larry's first time as a sort of fully fledged director in a feature film. He'd done shorts before at this point and done some work in like ants and sort of bits and bobs, but never a fully fledged film. In terms of like a a confident first time at bat, I can't say there's been much better. No, I mean, it just seems like it was a real case of someone who built up a steady flow of information and training to have the perfect skill set to take something like this on. And it was just interesting to hear him talk about how, you know, like the Cats and Dogs sequel it was never, it, it just never really became a thing mm-hmm. that he would make. But I would have been interested to see in an alternate reality what he would have done had they made, say, Cats and Dogs 2, like two or three years later, what he would have used in terms of evolving everything he learned on the first movie and carrying it over. Yeah, because we haven't watched the two sequels yet. We will tackle them on the show. And frankly, I'm... Uh... A bit hesitant, but we do this for you. We watch the film sometimes so you don't have to. But I'm glad we had this as kind of like the the, the gold standard of what this Cats and Dogs franchise can do. And now everything will be measured up to this sort of benchmark. Well, just to pivot us away slightly from that point, Cam, something I wanted to bring up was the, the sort of curveball that Larry threw our way. We didn't know this was coming, but he showed us a clip of a bit of test footage of Alan Rickman as Mr. Tinkles, the villainous cat of the film. When you hear that in the interview as well, there's a little bit of test footage there. We had no idea that was coming. That was really cool to see, but sort of speaking in a larger sense about the cast is what I want to expand into that as well. Just the ease of which he, he got all these people involved. And just hearing that story about popping around to Charlton Heston's house just casually to 
do a voice recording with him and, and get like was it Soylent Green he got signed? Yes, yeah, a poster of Soylent Green. Yeah, yeah, like that. That that. Well, we can't can't happen now, but. I can't imagine like popping over to Patrick Stewart's house and getting him to sign a Star Trek First Contact poster. <laughs> or a Masterminds poster. <laughs> what would be the one that would really surprise him if you got him to sign it? Um, I mean, Masterminds would shock the hell out of him. Conspiracy theory, maybe. What is the TV show he did before Star Trek Picard where he plays like a news anchor and it was very poorly received? Oh, I don't know. Listeners, you can let us know. That joke fell terribly, but hey, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, but Cam, anything else from you you want to bring up? No, I mean, I think in our best interviews, you really get a case of a filmmaker taking us through the journey of the making of a film in a way that is both informative, but also gives a lot of technical insight into how they achieved what ultimately wound up on screen. And I think that Larry just did a fantastic job of conveying very, very complicated production information in a way that I was consistently interested in hearing. There were some funny anecdotes in there as well. And I hope everyone who listened really appreciated kind of this inside look at a movie that definitely has name value out there, but maybe they never really thought about the details that would go into making a movie like this. Which I think is testament to not only his dedication to the project his passion for the project, but also testament to the amazing things that the Spymaster interview series can do. Mm. Because it can be as flexible as talking to Mariam Darbo, Jacqueline Bissett about their appearance in a Bond film, uh, to like the nuts and bolts of how a film is put together from its director. The sort of flexibility of the series, and it never ceases to amaze me, not only that people even say yes to us in the first place, but people are so generous with their time. I, I am in the same boat as you. I am consistently bowled over at not only the people you book on the show, but also in the stories we get and how completely diverse all the various accounts are in terms of what brought them to the industry and also how they achieved what they set out to achieve. I think maybe when the show potentially eventually ends, we'll sit back and look over our sort of not only our reviews, but our interview series, kind of like Thanos in his garden at the end of Infinity War and just sort of quietly smile at it. I think so. Mm, and, and then maybe sleep a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there you go, folks. That was our chat with Mr. Larry Guterman. And our last bit of intel about 2001's Cats and Dogs. We will be returning with the follow-ups. We'll probably put them together in a bit of a double bill just to save you all the time. But Cam, the question goes to you, sir. What have we got coming up next week? It's been a while since we've tackled any Hitchcock on the Spy Hards feed. Well, it's time to go back. We are going to look at 1966's Torn Curtain, starring Paul Newman and Julie Andrews. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we tackle Torn Curtain. And as I mentioned earlier, if you like what you heard on this podcast, please make sure you hit the subscribe button and leave us a five-star review. And if you don't already, make sure you follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next time, listeners, I'll leave you all with a question. Terminator versus the Cat Ninja, who wins? (laughs) 